Well, hello, uh, my name is Patrick Zinda with Chesapeake Technology. I wanted to welcome everyone to our third webinar uh, in the series. And today we're gonna be looking at uh, the tools available in SonarWiz for cleaning up noisy bathymetric data. Uh, this is gonna be a fairly intermediate talk. We won't be going over uh, you know, the basics of bathymetry data, importing, uh, project creation. We'll have other webinars for that specifically. Uh, and it should take about 45 to 50 minutes. So first and foremost, why are we going over this? Why is this important? Um, we've got a really great data set we're gonna take a look at this morning. Uh, this is from a USGS survey um, using a pull-mounted Rezon 7111 uh, back in 2014 off the coast of Chenega Island in Alaska. Uh, our own David Finlayson was actually on the survey. Uh, and the story goes that before they started recording the data, uh, one of the crew members was pulling the system out of the water before transit using a gaff with a big fishing uh, large hook on the end of it ended up damaging uh, the port side transducer before they started recording. So this wasn't a survey where they could head back to base and swap out the system um, and head back out another day. They, they were there and they had to record what they could so, and see if they could salvage it in post-processing. Uh, so for this webinar, we're gonna take this data set and then we're gonna walk through the various post-processing tools in SonarWiz to see if we can clean it up a little bit. Uh, for the agenda for today, uh, first we're gonna we're gonna hit the merge dialog. Um, this is how information from your platform position sensor, your motion sensor, and your multi-beam system will be combined together to create those that point cloud, those sample elevations. Um, now we're not gonna we're not gonna handle all the settings in here. We're gonna assume that we're we've got fully merged data, uh, but there's a few uh, options in here we want to go over um, that can help us with cleaning up the data. Uh, then we're going to jump over to the filter dialog. This is where the majority of our post-merge automatic filters are stored. We're going to briefly hit each of those, um, and this is a good place to start to try to remove um, mass quantities of uh, of bad data uh, in our in our point clouds. After this, we're going to be heading over to SonarWiz uh, and leaving the PowerPoint, uh, so I can actually physically walk you guys through um, the navigation attitude editor. There's a couple uh, things we want to look at there. There's a low pass filter option in there. Uh, and then we're gonna jump straight into our actual physical editor. So that'll be the swath editor. Um, this um, will go over a, a grid edit workflow that we like to, to show off um, and how to reject soundings. Uh, we'll jump over to the grid editor um, and we'll, we'll walk through the data piece by piece to do a final cleanup. And then we'll talk about some of the final works uh, in creating a, a new grid. So starting with the merge dialog, since we've covered bathymetry in previous versions, I'm not gonna go over uh, all the specifics here. Um, but we're going to start in the prod. We're going to start at the point in a project where we've already created your vessel, uh, applied the necessary merge settings, and we have that point cloud displayed. Um, there are some options in this dialog that we can be used for filtering uh, that I want to go over. Uh, the first option we want to talk about is downsampling. Um, down here. Uh, so the like I said, the first uh, the, the one of the only options in this merge dialog that we want to go over is downsampling. Uh, it's the its purpose is to reduce the number of soundings, um, and it it does so by binning the data if your sonar produces an excessively high volume of data. Uh, it works great for improving uh, bottom detection results, um, but the reason I wanted to bring it up now is that there are some future filtering options. Uh, we have a couple density filters um, that that work in a similar fashion, and we're not going to be able to use those as efficiently if we apply downsampling at the start. Um, so this is something you wanna take into consideration. Uh, both downsampling and the density filters um, will simply flag the data, not remove the data. Uh, but this is something you just wanna look out for uh, when you're merging instead of uh, in the filter process. Uh, the second page on the merge dialog is the error model section. Uh, and the error model determines how SonarWiz will compute the positional uncertainty of each of the soundings. Um, this is not gonna be applicable for all surveys, um, but we have four types of error models that you can apply. Obviously the first one being no error model. So um, if we, uh, we'll pull the, uh, so we'll, we won't attach any uncertainty values um, to any of the soundings unless um, you use the second option, which is the sonar provided model. So what this is gonna do is it's going to, uh, some systems, uh, you know, client and barometers, um, they will store uncertainty values for each sounding uh, during recording. Um, so if you use that second option, the sonar provided model will pull whatever the system uh, wrote into the raw data, we'll pull it straight into your project. Uh, the third option is the simple IHO model. Um, this can be used when you don't have all the values necessary for a full error model. 
um, but you want to use uh, the error model to uh, to make a, for example, to make a cube grid uh, later on when you're cleaning up your bathymetry data. Uh, and we have four options for applying um, a simple IHO model. Um, they're all based on the clearance level uh, underneath the vessel um, and can be, and, and I've got a, a picture here on the left of what that looks like in our merge dialog. Uh, the final option, which we won't have a, uh, we don't have enough time to go through completely, and honestly, I don't have the expertise to, is a full error model. Now, this requires uh, a full description uh, of the vessel. Uh, and the full model in SonarWiz needs uh, all of the direct offsets from the transducer and your accuracy of your measurements. Um, so this is a pretty time intensive uh, process, but if you do have all those values from your survey and if they were recorded well, um, you can apply those here and, and apply a full error model to your data. Um, and that can be really helpful for cube grading down, down the line. So now let's talk about these, uh, these flags and how SonarWiz handles uh, throwing out data versus uh, flagging it. So we don't actually in remove any of the data. Uh, each sounding in SonarWiz, once it's merged, uh, can live in two different states. It can be flagged uh, accepted or rejected. Um, and that's how a lot of these filters are going to be functioning. It's going to be flagging data um, to be accepted or rejected. And this first menu option before we jump into the filters is really important because it's going to tell you, uh, it's going to choose how SonarWiz is going to handle upon every merge, those flags and all of the soundings. So the enable filter flag reset option if turned on, uh, will reset the flags for soundings after every single merge. So if a, if a sounding has been rejected previously, if you merge it again using new settings, uh, all bets are off. Everything comes back to accepted uh, before the next merge process starts. And we've got four options for which flags, uh, you know, which flag soundings uh, will behave like this, will turn back on for every merge. Uh, the first one being the automatic filter flags. So this will reset all of the samples that have been flagged during using some of these automatic filter that I'm going to be talking about here shortly. Uh, the second option is the down sample filter flag. So again, this will reset, talking previously about the down sampling option, this will reset those flag samples. Um, the third one is the manual filter flags. And then the fourth one is the manufacturer filter flags. And by default, these last two are always set to no unless chosen otherwise, because you get yourself into some trouble. The manual filter flags are ones that you have manually cleaned using some of the editors that we're gonna talk about. Last thing you wanna do is work hours on cleaning out uh, bad points and flyers in your data, and then a, a fresh merge uh, could could throw all of those, those data points back into the point cloud. So uh, that one's set to know, and then the manufacturer filter flags, if you have that setting applied, we're assuming that those, those points are, are uh, rejected right off the bat. Um, so we've got that set to no as well. So uh, real quickly, I'm not going to go over each one of these very specifically, but these are the automatic filter flag options that we have in the filter dialog. So during merge process, uh, the first three are really simple. Um, it's a quick way to either filter out specific channels. Um, again, we mentioned that manufacture flag filter. So whatever was flagged um, by the system during acquisition, we can we can filter those out. And then we have a simple frequency filter that would allow you to set a minimum and maximum accepted frequency. Now we're jumping into a little more of the algorithmic filters. Um, we have an amplitude filter. Uh, this is used to turn off samples with specifically low amplitude. Um, there's an along track filter uh, that, that uh, computes flag samples based on them falling outside of, the uh, of a location previously designed. So it tries to track the seabed um, as, it, as it runs through and if it, and if it finds a bin of data that doesn't follow that seabed, it'll flag those. And then a very simple range filter where we're looking for samples that are either too close or too far away from the system. Uh, the next three that we have a cutoff angle filter, again, fairly uh, self-explanatory. We're looking for samples uh, too close to the nadir or far away from the outer beams. We're just using an inner and uh, outer uh, cutoff angle. Uh, we have uh, a sample density filter, so that is looking for samples that fall uh, far away from neighboring sam samples. So it's going to bin your data similar to uh, other density filters um, and flag all points that don't have a, a, speci a specified uh, density. Then we have a static box filter um, that will flag all the samples that fall outside of the defined box based in a minimum and maximum depth. So you're just cutting out data that doesn't fit. Um, your specified parameters. And then finally, we have a dynamic box filter that will uh, change based on uh, the seafloor. 
So let's head over to SonarWiz uh, and try out a couple of these filters and talk about some of the manual editing that we can do. I've got SonarWiz open here. So here's the same data set that I was looking at uh, in the video earlier. Uh, I've got it merged into SonarWiz and you can see that it is fairly noisy. Um, so what I've done so far, I've got it merged and I've created a couple uh, of cube grids um, that we're gonna use for some of the editing down the road. Um, and I also applied the cutoff angle filter to remove a decent chunk of the noise that we were, we were seeing near the surface. But as you can tell, um, there's still a lot left we can do here. Uh, briefly, before we open up this data in any of the surface editors, I wanted to show you where we could uh, access the navigation and attitude data stored within the files. And in that, we can apply a few filters and there's a low pass filter in there I wanted to discuss. Um, to access the navigation and attitude editor, you will either select a file and in the context menu by right clicking, there's an option to open the navigation and attitude editor, but it also is available in the bathymetry tab up here on the top uh, under navigation and attitude editor. And since these editors take a little bit to open, I've already pre-opened uh, each one of them. So when you open the nav uh, navigation and attitude editor in this display, we have the navigation track line showing in the plain view um, with the one selected that we, uh, we right clicked on being highlighted. Uh, on the left here, we have a tabbed view of all the data. And then on the right, we can graph that data uh, with a couple options here. And in order to change these graphs uh, here on the top left, there's an option for graph selection. And to open up on my other screen here, I'm gonna move it over. So by default, we've got the pitch, roll, heading, and heave displayed in my graph views, um, but I can use any of these fields uh, stored within my bathymetric data, and I can graph it on the right. So all you would need to do to, to move something over is select it on the left, and then use the arrow keys uh, to move it over, and vice versa. Now, we're not going to edit any of these values. Uh, we'll, we'll do bathymetric post-processing in a different webinar. Um, but I did want to note the low pass filter option here in the editing tab. So up here on the top, uh, we have an option for a low pass filter. Um, and this gives you the option to select the files and the values, all the values that we can graph, we can also apply this low pass filter to. Um, so if I wanted to, uh, to, to filter the pitch, I would choose the value one that I wanted to, to apply the filter to, um, choose which uh, filtering function I wanted to use. So if I want a running average or running median, uh, choose the smoothing kernel in seconds and then hit OK. And uh, this can be really useful. We don't see this uh, used as often anymore uh, with fully integrated multi-beam systems um, that, you know, that integrate their position and IMU configuration. Um, but the option is available, especially for a quick way to uh, smooth out uh, uh, any spikes or issues. So back to the main display here, uh, if I turn off this bathymetric data and I open up my cube grid I made, um, the first thing I did was make a really low resolution cube grid uh, for, for a few reasons. Uh, first, there's a, a few filters in some of the editors that can use a good uh, smooth grid that doesn't sh display a lot of the spikes that I'm seeing in the, in the raw bathymetry. Um, that I can use. And also it's a good reference point as I clean up the data um, down the road, I can make uh, a higher resolution grid um, to, to, to show my cleaned up results. So turning back on the bathymetry data here, uh, the first editor I'm gonna start with is the swath editor. Um, this is looking at a specific line uh, in my project instead of a generalized area. It can be accessed the same way as the navigation and attitude editor uh, by selecting a file, right clicking, and selecting swath editor. It's also available up here in the bathymetry tab as well. And I already have one of my lines I want to look at opened in the swath editor. Now I've got this configured a bit differently. There's a uh, separate views that you can open up here in the swath editor. Um, but from the left here, uh, we've got a subset manager. So we're going to see all the lines loaded up in our project. Uh, and then some of these settings that we're gonna go over. Uh, first, most importantly, we're looking at a 3D point cloud display of this, um, of this specific line. And the first thing I wanna note is that my cutoff range filter um, seemed to do a fairly good job. Uh, the rejected samples I have drawn currently are in white uh, and the non-rejected, the accepted samples are in green. Um, and I can always turn that off using this checkbox here in the general tab. It's gonna take a little bit to load because it's a decent size point cloud. 
But with showing my rejected samples, I'm realizing that uh, the cutoff angle might have been a, a little bit high. Um, I cleaned up a lot of this noise here we're seeing, but also I, I definitely lopped off some of the seabed. Um, and that uh, allows me to kind of show off uh, the two ways in which we can filter data. Um, the common notion being that we would use filtering to remove points, but we can also apply some of these filters that we have access to to re-accept points. Uh, so to so flip that flag back from rejected to accepted. So up here at the top, um, we have the four options for filters in this, uh, this editor. Uh, the first one being the min-max filter. Now, as I use these editors, there are three different options for how to, um, we're gonna be selecting points. Now we have to tell SonarWiz what we wanna do with those selected points. Uh, by default, uh, the auto mode is turned off. Um, so I would have to select the points using one of these filters and then hit the either accept or reject button. Um, but otherwise I can also have it auto reject all the points I select or auto accept all the points I select. I wanna choose because I'm going to be removing some more points and bringing some back to life. So I'm gonna leave it on auto mode off. Let's start with looking at the minimum and maximum filter. This is uh, fairly self-explanatory. You're just using either depth or amplitude, and then you're setting a minimum and maximum, um, which you want to cut off or accept new data. Now, the neat part about these filters is as I adjust the settings in here, um, so if I increase the minimum, you'll see that on the bottom cross-track view, um, the area highlighted in red is where this filter is uh, removing data. And on my point cloud here, all my selected points are going to start highlighting in red. Let me increase the point size here, a little bit easier to see. So as I increase this minimum, I can scroll down and I can cut out all the data I want either on the top or on the bottom. And so I'm going to uh, bring this down here to about 411. Let's, let's try to cut out a lot of this uh, extra noise here. So once I have the point selected, again, I have auto mode turned off. Um, so that means I need to choose whether I want to accept or reject all the selected points. I'm going to reject them. And before I, um, before I uh, uncheck this show rejected samples, because once I've removed them, I don't necessarily want to look at them more. I want to recover some of this data that my cutoff range filter uh, ended up hacking off here. So I'm going to use the same min and max filter except I'm going to use the inside range option. I'm going to lower the, the minimum here to get a little closer to the seafloor. And then with these points selected, I'm going to accept these. And we can do some more filtering later. Um, some of the grid surface filtering will remove some of this uh, excess noise just off the seafloor, but I wanted to make sure I retained the entire seafloor. Uh, the second option is another density filter. This is the one that I mentioned previously um, could be affected by the downsampling option that we are looking at in the merge dialog. Um, this is uh, this will use a bin size in Easting and Northing um, and will bin the data, uh, as you can see here in the cross-track view, and will reject or accept all the samples that don't meet the specified number of points in that bin. Um, so I can adjust the size of the bin um, using the arrow keys. And I can adjust the number of points using uh, the up and down arrow keys. And you can see as I, as I increase the num minimum number of points, we're losing some of this data um, up here that's floating. Now, I don't think this point density filter is gonna do us very well because this noise is very dense. Uh, we're not gonna be able to distinguish that from the actual seafloor. But this can be really useful for uh, just straight removing flyers. Uh, the last two options in this editor are the polyline and polygon filter. They work very similarly, one being um, you configure a line that you draw across your view, um, and then you can remove all the data above it and below it. Um, and once you select one of these filters, uh, you should get prompted to start drawing on your view um, using the left mouse button. So this is a really quick way, um, I, you have to hold shift uh, to draw on this. To draw out shapes uh, in the view, you can do this either in the 3D view or the cross-track view. 
and use it to select. Oh, I got it stuck here. I think I have to shift select back. Let me clear that shape. We'll try one more time. Got it stuck on my window. Here we go. So on the bottom here, it's in white. Let me, let me, uh, sorry, let me one more time. I'm going to reject these, show these rejected samples so we don't have to look at it. So if I wanted to remove some more of this data in the cross track view, I'm going to hit the polygon filter up here. I can draw this uh, feature in my cross track view. And I can either choose to accept or reject all the samples. Right now, I have it set to outside the polygon, which is why it flagged everything uh, that I didn't want it to. Let's have it go within the polygon. And if I'm happy with that, I can reject those. Now, it's, it's good to know that we have a few options here for drawing uh, outside of these filters in these views. Uh, currently, I have it set to polygonal. Um, but there's three options here. Uh, everyone seems to have their, their favorite. Um, there's rectangle, which will allow me just to draw uh, using holding the shift key, uh, rectangles in, in looking for points. And it's still picking up a little bit of those rejected samples. I can set it to polygon, which will allow me to draw a shape. And then the lasso, which is a free draw. So it'll always stay completely connected uh, as a closed polygon but it allows me to draw um, any sort of shape around. And this is really good for maneuvering around hard places. Uh, as I rotate this 3D view, uh, if I wanted to clean up some of this data, but I didn't want to get my seafloor, it gives me the opportunity to really get in there um, and make sure I avoid removing samples that I want to keep. Reject those. All right, so I'm going to close out of the swath editor as I'm, I, I've rejected of the samples. There's no, there, you don't need to save because as I use these commands, the, the point cloud is going to be updated in the main display. Um, and that is a way to go from line to line. But if we want to edit um, on a larger scale and we want to include the points from all the files, we're going to want to use the area editor. And there are two different ways um, that you can open up the area editor. Uh, the first way is up here in the bathymetry tab. Um, you can either choose to select a rectangular area to edit or a polygonal. I'm going to use a rectangular and I'm going to grab a piece of this data uh, to take a look at in the editor. So let's, let's grab this right here. Now, the area editor has similar views as the swath editor, um, with the exception being that uh, as the flows on the top here, we are going to be looking at a gridded view um, so as soon as I select that point cloud in the main display, uh, SonarWiz is going to create a grid up here in which I can edit off of as well. Takes a little second to load. As you can see, it's really picking up that noise quite nicely. Um, but it has the same options here on the general tab. We can choose uh, the point size um, to either show rejected samples or not. Um, down here at the bottom, similar to the swath editor, we have a, a subset of details. It'll give me the dimensions of the area that I selected um, and a total sample count with which ones I have filtered out by manually, um, by some of the automatic filtering, as well as percentages. And I can also adjust the color display. Um, I can either, there's a couple options that I can color by. Let me scroll down here. Uh, by default, I had it, I had it written uh, as looking at the elevation values, but I can also uh, edit based on the amplitude. Uh, the survey line, if I've, since I've got multiple lines opened up here, um, or the ping. And we're going to stick with elevation, uh, and I like the default settings here um, at the color map. Now, with this, we have some of the same filters that we saw in the swath editor. We have the minimum and maximum filter and the density filter, and uh, with the exception of these two new filters, as well as an edit grid option. So similarly to um, the 3D view in the swath editor, I can come in here um, using the lasso tool, and I can attempt to remove some of this data um, 
So let's try using the lasso here. I'm going to try to cut out a good portion of this, this noise in the water column. And as I make edits to this uh, 3D view, my, my grid view won't update unless I hit this update grid. So as I remove that section, SonarWiz will regrid the data um, with, the, uh, with the new points that I've rejected uh, gone from the grid. So let's try to remove this big chunk here, see if we can get some of these spikes to, um, to update. Looking a little better. Now let's start to use some of the automatic filter options. Uh, first, uh, let's use this edit grid option here. So that will open up uh, the grid view as the main display. Um, and there are two options here I want to take a look at. We have an interpolate function uh, and a remove spikes function. And obviously, we have some decent spikes here um, as the gridder was unable to look past the noise that was uh, prevalent in the water column here. So uh, when you select the remove spikes option, You'll have an option to um, choose the area that you want to start removing spikes from. Um, the kernel size, I'm going to set this to, let's go with 15. Um, and then some options on what to do with those flag cells and how to determine what is a spike and what is not a spike. Uh, so I'm going to set this to 50% of the kernel depth range. Um, and I'm going to tell SonarWiz that if it finds one of these spikes that I want to reject it. Actually, let's start with leave selected just so we can see what it pulls up with. So it didn't do much there. Let's try to set this kernel size a little higher. Might be selecting them out of there. Let me try, I want to just reject these. There we go. So because of the density of this uh, noise in the water column, we weren't able to pick up a lot of these spikes, um, but we did get a good amount of them. Um, this is really useful, especially when you have uh, singular flyers that are causing some of these spikes. Um, this tool can be really useful. Now, the problem is, is that now that we've removed those spikes, um, we have a lot of holes. Um, and if we had holes in the grid already, um, just based on our ping spacing, we also have an interpolate function in here and that works very similarly. The top here, we choose uh, what area we want to interpolate. Um, I know that these holes are probably going to be closer to 25 meters. Um, so I'm going to try that. And that was able to interpolate most of the holes. Uh, there's a big one here, but we can, we've can we got some other tools outside of this editor that we can take a look at. So if I'm happy with how I've edited this, I can accept the changes and I can move back to the point cloud. Um, and there's another option I want to look at which is the grid surface filter. Now, this is a great option. Uh, this will take the grid view that SonarWiz has created. It will bring a, a subset of the image here into the 3D point cloud. Uh, and then we can filter points um, that don't correlate uh, with a percentage of the Z range from the grid um, using this filter. So you can see right now with 0.01%, the lowest it can be, um, it's picking up almost every point, but as I increase this, because of the the, nat the natural smoothing that's done uh, when a gridded surface is created, I can really start to pick out some of these flyers, um, data points that are above and below. Um, so I'm going to set this to, let's do 3%. And I'm happy with that. So I've got these points selected. I'm going to reject them. And I was able to get a decent amount of the noise done. And then uh, you can, this is a step-by-step -step process. So then I could update the grid, interpolate, and then retry. Um, and that's a pretty uh, time ex intensive process. Um, there's another option we can do. There's a whole nother mode for the grid editor um, that I wanted to show off. Instead of, close this out, instead of allowing SonarWiz to make that grid from the point cloud that I selected, I can use the cube grid that I created earlier. 
um, that has a, a pretty heavy dimension, 75 by 75, which really smooth out a lot of this noise. And I can open the grid editor in a special version um, based on the grid that I created. So um, this is useful for this data set, um, but specifically also if you had a previous uh, survey that was much cleaner, uh, if you had a, a clean bathymetry surface, you can load that into your project um, and do your editing and use that grid surface filter based on that better uh, that better grid. Um, so once it's selected, I gotta make sure my, my points are turned on here. I'm gonna right click my grid uh, in the Project Explorer, and I'm going to select Grid Editor. So now, instead of uh, specifying a certain rectangle or polygon in the main display, it's going to open up all the points that are within this uh, 75 by 75 cube grid that I created. Now, right off the bat, it's not gonna show you the point cloud because this is a way too large, but you can already tell uh, that this grid has much less spikes uh, than the previous one. Uh, to start off with, I'm going to use the same edit grid function. I'm gonna interpolate through these holes. Um, I think 100 by 100 will do it. Let's try that. Yeah, perfect. So now I've got a decent surface to work with here. I'm gonna accept these changes. And uh, one of the cool ways to do this is I like to zoom out um, and try to get a, a decent map view, so from top down. And then using the Shift Select button, you can draw specified areas in which you want to look at with the point cloud. So I'm going to start with uh, this, this square here in the corner and hold Shift, uh, draw the square. And then you'll see that now SonarWiz is going to take all the points in that uh, small area and open it up in the point cloud here. So now we're seeing some of the same noise, um, but instead of using uh, a very uh, messy grid that SonarWiz created with all the noise, I've got my fairly low resolution cube grid that will allow me to, to stick with the seafloor when I use this grid surface filter. So now I'm gonna select the grid surface filter. You can see that it's, uh, it's put in my grid here. Uh, let's up the Z range. Still picking up a little bit of my seafloor there, so let's jump to 4%. My goal is just to remove uh, this area over here. And that did a pretty good job. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna accept that and I'm gonna reject those points. So this allows you, uh, especially on a uh, lower end PC that, that can't handle displaying that entire point cloud, you can uh, reduce the size that in what you're looking at. You can make the edits. Um, so if I wanted to use some of the automatic algorithms like the grid surface filter, um, then let's say I found some, let's see if we can find some additional flyers here. I can use the lasso option and you can clean up uh, little areas. And so let's say uh, I've gotten all that I need to do on this section. Let's let it uh, set the flags here. Uh, now I want to move over to the next section. So you go back to the grid view and using holding the shift key, let's use the arrow button to the right and it should jump me exactly one space over to the right. And this one looks pretty good. Now I'm going to show off the, uh, the density filter on this one. Um, because I don't, I think I can distinguish between the, the very clean seafloor and some of these flyers here. Um, so using the density filter, I'm going to use uh, X to Z. Let's scroll in here. Adjust the vertical range. And I'm going to up the minimum points to say 30. So I'm picking up a lot of these flyers here uh, and let's reject those. So now I'm happy with this section and I can either move right um, using the same shift select key 
Uh, you can also go up and down. And as you can tell, even with this very small section, uh, my laptop here that I'm running this off of with GoToWebinar and a few of the other editors, it's struggling uh, at some points in time to display this point cloud. So this really allows you, uh, if you don't have a high-end machine, to, to manually edit this without uh, completely bogging down your system. Uh, let's try the grid surface filter again, because we're, we're going up on one of these uh, higher elevation areas. And sorry if you can hear, it's a poor, it's raining cats and dogs here. Hopefully that's not coming in through my mic. And let's reject these. So now that we have some of this editing done, uh, I want to try to hit uh, this, this main area here where I knew a lot of the noise was. So um, instead of using the shift uh, arrow keys, I'm gonna draw a new area, not that. Let's hit this area right here, because I know I, I have a lot of noise uh, in the water column here. Now, there is a lot going on here. Um, so in this situation, it's much harder to tell uh, what is uh, truly noise and what isn't. Um, we have an option here uh, to draw a subset. Um, so if you use uh, under the subset selection, if I draw a profile um, and I use the control key, I can draw a horizontal, horizontal cross section across my data. Um, and I can also use the filtering options uh, through this cross section. Uh, so using that, it's pretty evident uh, where I can find the seafloor. Um, and it just gives me another way uh, of taking a look at a, a, a 2D view um, to determine if I'm truly picking up the seafloor or if I'm, um, if I'm removing data that's good. And uh, these, arrow, these arrow keys here will allow us to step through the data and keep track of the seafloor. Uh, and so last time when I tried to use the grid surface filter on this area uh, here in the center, um, it didn't do too well because my grid was created with the noisy data uh, and there were a lot of spikes um, and holes that I made. But now uh, the grid surface filter is doing a really great job of removing most of that bad data. So I'm happy with that. So let's reject all of these points. And it's quite a bit of data here, so it's gonna take a second to set all those flags correctly. And so now uh, it's much easier to do um, manual editing um, in this without all of that noise. So I can come in and do some final touches uh, to, to really clean up this data set. Let's clear that profile out. And let's uh, let's make sure we don't have anything left. I know there were some some trouble areas over here. And if I'm happy with that, I can jump back out of here. And I was able to clean up a lot of this noise here in the center. Um, if you uh, if you're if you're running through a big data set like this and you're unsure of what areas uh, you've previously edited, we have the option here in the view tab under bathymetry views to open up the uh, bathy area selections that we've made previously in this project. Uh, and as you can tell, I was working with this quite a bit, um, so I can let me clear some of these selections out. I think you have to right click them. So let's try this again one more time. So I'm going to open up uh, a specified area here in the area editor. And now I have uh, an exact layout of that area um, that I edited previously. And it's a good way to keep track of where you have and have not edited. Um, and if I need to re-hit that area, um, minus out here real quick, 
you can take these selections that, that, that act similarly as features, um, and if you right-click them in their context menu, you can choose to either edit the bathymetry in the area, so you'll open up the area editor again. Um, you can grid the data um, if, the, if, if, correct, if it's a correct uh, a single line, you can also run a patch test on the profile. Um, you can open up a cross section of the data. Um, so it's a, it's a really nice way to keep track of where you uh, have edited and haven't edited in the project. So let's try to clean up the last bit of this data here because it's pretty noisy and it's, it's, it's still looking fairly bad. So I'm going to open up the grid editor one more time. So let's use shift select again and let's grab this section. And now using the grid surface filter again, I'm going to remove all of this noise. So now if I'm happy with the editing that I've done, um, we can create a new grid. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll turn off the 75 by 75 uh, cube grid that I made when the data was fairly noisy. And now I can do a, a much higher resolution grid. Um, and you can run this through a step-by-step -step process. If you, um, if you wanted to start with a very low resolution grid, um, like the 75 by 75, run through the data using the grid surface filter to clean up a lot of the excess points. And then you could create a, a 30 by 30 or a 50 by 50 um, and run through the same process step by step um, to try to uh, get the, the point cloud to be almost identical to the seafloor. Um, obviously, there's still some work I could do in this area. Um, but if I want to create a new grid, if I'm happy with my results, um, you can right click grids and select create a new grid. Uh, and recently, we've made some adjustments to this. Um, the, the gridder functions based usually uh, by default on the in, some of the internal values that we can grid. Um, we'll be looking at the CDF, um, so the bathymetric file format for SonarWiz. Um, we can, we'll be looking at the depth value. We can also uh, grid based on amplitude. Um, you can grid side scan data. Uh, and then now, as of the latest release, you can also grid um, the magnetometer data in, in the project. Um, so previously, I made a cube grid. Now, the only way uh, you can use the cube grid um, is if there are some sort of uncertainty values stored within these files. Um, so there are some optional grid outputs you can use here. Uh, by default, we, uh, we also will make an uncertainty grid as well as two hypothesis grids. Um, I don't need those necessarily. And I know that because of ping spacing, uh, the, the highest resolution grid cell size I can get is about a 20 by 20. So let's make a new grid here and we'll hit OK. So now let's turn off our bathymetry files and see how we did. So already comparatively to the, uh, to the original 20 by 20 grid I made here, we started to remove a lot of the bad data. Um, and with this new higher resolution grid, I could run through the same process. I could reopen the point cloud, uh, come in here and try to remove some of this uh, this noise here, uh, but the end result is hopefully uh, a clean data set. Um, whereas, you know, on the ship during uh, during the survey, uh, uh, the the idea was that this data was going to be ruined because of the damage to the transducer. Uh, but with some of these post processing tools, uh, we're able to clean it up fairly well uh, and create a really really good looking uh, bathymetric surface. So that's all I have for uh, for the editing tools. Let's jump back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, and to always like to mention uh, how to get help. Um, we have some uh, great quick reference guides that we've been working on on our website. Um, but if you ever have any questions at all, um, we are here uh, to help. We're the support team here at, at Chesapeake. And if you've got a, a data set that you're having trouble with and you have uh, an updated EMA, we'd be happy to take a look. Uh, so feel free to visit our support website, uh, chesapeaketech.com. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, write up a ticket and we'd be happy to get back with you. 
Now I'm looking at the question log here uh, on the uh, on GoToWebinar, and I do not see any additional questions that haven't been answered. Uh, is there an order of operations for the filters listed under Merge if multiple filters are turned on? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I, I do not know the answer to that question. David, do you know if uh, signal, similar to signal processing, if we have an order of operations on those filters? Well, there David. is an order of operations, but I think it's in the order that they're listed, but I'll have to check back. Um, we can, we'll post a kind of a Q and A response to this webinar at the end. And I need to double check to make sure that that's true. But I think that they're, they're operating in the order that they're listed from top to bottom. Okay, well, I appreciate everyone joining us. Um, this is the last webinar for this series, um, but as, as the world is still closed down. I'm sure we'll be doing more webinars uh, here in the future. So stay tuned on our website and, and our emails, uh, and we will uh, we will let you know when we're doing another one. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, everyone have a great rest of your day.